Well, two-dimensional signal processing just extends many of the same concepts that we've looked at in one-dimensional signal processing. Now, in one-dimensional signal processing, it's common to have the independent variable represent time. In 2D, it's usually conventional to have the independent variable represent space. So we're going to assume that our two dimensions are space, such as you have in an image. And we're going to look at the continuous case first before we consider sampling in space. Now the obvious application for 2D signal processing is imaging. And another value of looking at the 2D case is it becomes apparent how to extend our signal processing ideas to three and higher dimensions. Three-dimensional imaging you can think about like medical applications such as MRI, which are three-dimensional. And then if you bring time in, let's say you're imaging the heart and how the circulation occurs over time, well then you have a four-dimensional image. So if we have an image, we're going to assume that the two independent variables or dimensions are x and y, and that f of x comma y represents the signal or the two-dimensional image in this case. So if I have a 2D system, I can put f of x comma y into it through some system h, and then that's going to give me g of x comma y, which is just the system acting on the input image. Now in one-dimensional signal processing, we've spent a lot of time focusing on linear time invariant systems. And there's an analog to that in two-dimensional signal processing. It's called linear shift invariant systems. And systems that are linear and shift invariant have some special properties and are particularly useful to us. For a system to be linear shift invariant, it has to be both linear and shift invariant. So this first statement here is linearity, and it says that if I apply as the input to my system, a weighted sum of two images, and the weights are alpha 1 and alpha 2, the images are f1 and f2. If I apply a weighted sum as the input to my system, my output will be equal to a weighted sum of the outputs of the individual images. So this is a linearity property. It says if I add two things at the, at the input, it corresponds to adding the outputs. Now the shift invariant property says that if I shift the location of the image and I apply it to the system, that I get a shifted version of the output. Recall we said that if for a time invariant system in one dimension, we could delay or advance the input to the system in time, and that would correspond to the output being delayed or advanced in time. In other words, the behavior of the system didn't depend on time. It was independent of the time origin. Well, the same thing happens here, except with respect to space. And we're assuming that the behavior of the system is independent with respect to spatial location. It doesn't matter whether you're in the upper right corner of the image or the lower left corner of the image. The system acts the same way. Well, the input-output relationship for a linear shift invariant system is just a two-dimensional convolution. The output g of x comma y is just the double integral from minus infinity to infinity of h of x minus alpha comma y minus beta times the input f of alpha comma beta d alpha d beta. So this is a two-dimensional extension of our familiar one-dimensional convolution. And h, in this case, is a two-dimensional impulse response of the system. In other words, it's what you obtain at the output in response to an impulse located at the origin as an input. This impulse response is also known as a point spread function. The meaning of the term point spread function is pretty intuitive. If I have a point as an input, or the impulse over here, then what comes out is how that impulse gets spread by the system. I can also define two-dimensional Fourier transform, which is analogous to our familiar one-dimensional case. We'll let u and v be our frequency variables, where u is the frequency variable with respect to x, and v is the frequency variable in y, and then my 2D Fourier transform is a double integral minus infinity to infinity, f of x comma y times e to the minus j u x 
time e to the minus j v y dx dy. So we can think about this as a complex sinusoid with frequency u in the x coordinate, and here we have another complex sinusoid with frequency v in the y coordinate. Now the 2D Fourier transform can be interpreted by grouping terms here as I've done in this second line. And we see that it consists of a Fourier transform taken over x for all y. And then once we obtain that, we take a Fourier transform over y of all of these 1D Fourier transforms that we obtained. So I can think about Fourier transforming in the x direction and then taking that result and Fourier transforming it in the y direction. Now the inverse Fourier transform in 2D is again very similar to what we'd expect based on our 1D experience. We have 1 over 2 pi squared now, double integral minus infinity to infinity f of u comma v e to the j u x e to the j v y dx dy. And this has a familiar form of a sum of complex sinusoids. Okay, so we've got a complex sinusoid, e to the j u x, has frequency u in the direction x. We have another one, e to the j v y, and we're adding these combinations of sinusoids up in the x and y directions with weights given by u comma v. So I can think about decomposing my signal f of x comma y as a weighted combination of two-dimensional sinusoids. Now most of the standard Fourier transform properties can be easily extended to two dimensions. One that's particularly interesting for us is to look at the convolution multiplication property. And this follows from two-dimensional convolution and the relationship with two-dimensional Fourier transforms. And it turns out that if you take a system H and you apply an input of a two-dimensional complex sinusoid that has frequency u naught in the x direction and v naught in the y direction, that what you get out is a 2D complex sinusoid with the same frequencies but modified by h of u naught comma v naught, where h of u naught comma v naught is the 2D for a transform of the system's impulse response evaluated at u naught and v equals v naught. So recall in one dimensions we had that a sinusoidal input produced a sinusoidal output and the amplitude and phase of the output was modified by the Fourier transform of the impulse response at that particular frequency. We have the same thing happening here. We would say that 2D sinusoids of this form are eigenfunctions of linear shift invariant systems. Well, extending this idea more generally to an input f of x comma y that can be expressed using the Fourier transform as a weighted sum of 2D complex sinusoids, we get an output g of x comma y that is the convolution of the impulse response with the input and if I take that into the frequency domain, I find that my 2D Fourier transform of the output is just the product of the 2D Fourier transform of the impulse response and the 2D Fourier transform of the input. Our convolution multiplication property holds as it does in 1D, and this is a very powerful property because it allows us to think about 2D processing in the frequency domain.